first reading. A reading from the book of Job. From the heart of tempest, the Lord gave Job his answer. He said, Who pent up the sea behind closed doors when it leapt tumultuous out of the womb? When I wrapped it in a robe of mist and made black clouds its swaddling bound. When I marked the bounds, it was not to cross. I made it fast with the bolted gate. Come thus far, I said, and no further. Yea, your proud waves shall break. The word of the Lord. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. Some sailed to the sea in ships, to trade in the mighty waters. These men have seen the Lord's deeds, the wonders he does in the deep. For he spoke, he summoned the gale, closing the waves of the sea up to heaven and back into the deep. Their soul melted away in their distress. Then they cried to the Lord in their need, and he rescued them from their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper, all the waves of the sea he hushed. They rejoiced because of the calm, and he led them to heaven with desire. Let them thank the Lord for his love, the wonders he does for men. Second reading. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. The love of Christ overwhelms us when we reflect that if one man has died for all, then all men should be dead. And the reason he died for all was so that living men should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised to life for them. From now onwards, therefore, we do not judge anyone by the standards of the flesh. Even if we did once know Christ in the flesh, that is how we know him now. That is not how we know him now. And for anyone who is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old creation has gone, and now the new one is here. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to man. With the coming of evening, Jesus said to his disciples, Let us cross over to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him just as he was in the boat. And there were other boats with them. Then it began to blow again, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that it was almost swamped. But he was in the stern, his head on the cushion, asleep. They woke him up, they woke him and said to him, Master, do you not care? We are going down. And he woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Quiet now, be calm. And the wind dropped, and all was calm again. Then he said to them, Why are you so frightened? How is it that you have no faith? They were filled with awe, and said to one another, Who can be this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. The Gospel of the Lord.
Today we shall talk on the topic of fear and spirituality. Fear and spirituality. In the gospel that we just listened to, Jesus said to his disciples, Why are you so frightened? How is it that you have no faith? These questions, of course, we are in response to the disciples' fear when they were being tossed around in the boat by a powerful wind. Meanwhile, Jesus was with them in the same boat, but was described as, quote unquote, sleeping. You see, one of the greatest obstacles to spirituality is fear. Have you ever asked yourself why Jesus always tells his disciples to fear not? That expression, fear not, is scattered throughout the gospel as a statement coming from Jesus. Fear not. At every important moment in their lives, we will always tell them, fear not. Why? Why is Jesus always giving that injunction to his disciples to fear not? He knows that fear and spirituality are incompatible. No one can ever attain spiritual realm in a state of fear. No one. It is impossible. If we are able to conquer fear, we shall be at peace, not only with God, but more importantly, with ourselves. However, the lives of very many people are guided by fear. Fear of what had been, fear of what seemingly is, or fear of what might be. That is the summary of most of our lives. In the end, majority of people are born in fear, they live their entire life in fear, and they die in fear. A life of fear is an insecure life and is not worth living. It's not just an unexamined life that is not worth living, as Socrates said. A life of fear is not worth living. Let us stop for a moment and observe that what causes fear is not one's object of fear, but rather one's manner of perceiving that object of fear. That is what, what causes fear. Not one's object of fear, but one's manner of perceiving that object. Think of this for a while. It is your perception of an object or a situation that causes your fear rather than the object or the situation itself. It is your perception of those things that causes your fear, not those things themselves. This is also, uh, this is the type of, uh, this type of distorted uh, perception makes one run in fear for shelter even when one is under a shelter. And this is also the scenario that generates fear and makes one look for protection even when one is already under the protection of God. If a child is endangered, he runs to his mother for protection. 
But when that child is already under the protection of his mother, is there any need of running again? Certainly not. You know, in the psychology of a child, once he is under the protection of his mother or his father, he feels safe. Curiously, however, we adults run away from God in order to seek protection elsewhere. Isn't this ridiculous? We are with God, and yet, we are very afraid of cockroaches and rats, etc. The disciples were with Jesus in the boat, but they were afraid of the wind. The Lord of the wind was with them, yet they were afraid of the wind. Ironic. They were afraid because they believed that Jesus was quote unquote asleep. And how like many of us today, when we experience some difficulties, some trials, some torments, our first reaction is to think that Jesus sleeps and doesn't care. That's our first reaction. We look at the events of the world and ask ourselves why God doesn't do anything in order to prevent such catastrophe. We then shout towards God as though to wake him up and to ask him to act. We think that he wasn't always attentive to our needs in his eternal providence. We shout to wake Jesus up instead of allowing him to sleep in us. You know, it is not Jesus that needs to be woken. It is us that need to wake up to the reality that Jesus is with us. It is not Jesus that needs to be woken. It is us that needs to wake up to the reality that Jesus is with us. It is because we are asleep that we think that Jesus is sleeping. Our manner of prayer portrays us as a bunch of people praying to a sleeping God who needs to be constantly woken and reminded to do his job as God. And this is reminiscent of the drama that happened between Elijah and the 450 prophets of Baal in 1 Kings chapter 18 following. We know this story very well. When the challenge to know whose God we set fire on the bull offering began, Elijah was taunting the prophets of Baal to shout and pray, pray louder. Because perhaps, this is what he said, perhaps their God may be, may be busy or traveling. Or maybe he is sleeping and needed to be woken up. This is exactly what Elijah told him. And true enough, those prophets of Baal prayed louder and cut themselves with salt and spears until blood flowed. Go and read again that version, that section of the Bible, First King chapter, chapter 18. Many of us today still pray and act like the prophets of Baal and believe that this is how to wake God up 
to listen to our prayer, especially when we are faced with fear. But this manner of praying says rather that we are a sleeping bunch of worshippers who do not realize that God is a man in man well with us, God with us. That He is always with us, and as such, we need not be frightened. You know, a story is told of a little boy who was one of the occupants uh, uh, of a bus driven by a rather reckless driver. The driver was driving so recklessly and dangerously that all the occupants were shouting in panic, afraid of their lives. Among the occupants of this bus was a journalist who noticed that there was a little boy inside the bus who was unconcerned about the reckless way the driver was driving. So he was simply enjoying his chocolate and playing his video game. The journalist whispered to the child, Are you not afraid? that we might crash because of this reckless driver? And the boy said, no. I continued what he was doing. The journalist asked him again, why are you so confident and unafraid? Without taking his eyes off his video game, the boy replied, because that driver is my father. See what I mean? I'm on concern, I'm on afraid because that driver is my father. God is our father, yet every little thing frightens us. Wake up and realize that Jesus is beside you. Wake up. It is not by shouting that the prophets of God. We don't need to wake God up. He never sleeps. Even when the Bible says Jesus was reclining in the cushion asleep, he never sleeps. It's a human way of describing. And we keep on shouting and think that the person who shouts the loudest will be, will be the person who wakes God up. And the God will now hear his or her prayer first. There's nothing different between us and the, and the bad prophets, prophets of bad. We shout, cut ourselves, sweat, blood, cutting ourselves all in a frenzied manner, all in the name of praying, in order to wake God up. We are the people who are asleep. God never sleeps. The day you wake up, so the realization that God is with you, then you will understand that no, he doesn't need to be woken up. We just leave that at, uh, we just leave it at that. The other part of the gospel of today talks about the agitation of the sea, which threatened the disciples' boat. Now, apart from being interpreted by the fathers of the church as the image of the church which has witnessed all manners of turbulence throughout its long history, this section can also be interpreted as representing individual trials and tribulations that we encounter daily as Christians. Sometimes we might think that the disciples apparently did, that we are very good in navigation. We might try to navigate our way out of danger without God. Before the disciples called for help, it is most probable that 
they must have tried to rescue themselves on their own without help from Jesus who was apparently asleep. But they soon realized that no matter how good you are, no matter how good we are, how good they were, they could not overcome the storm alone. No matter how good you are, how perfect you think you are, you cannot overcome the storm alone. We too cannot overcome the storms of life alone without God. If we remember to quote unquote carry Jesus along with us, we will, we will be able to call on Him for help when we are being tossed around in the waters of life. But if we quote unquote forget Jesus and leave Him behind, we will not be able to save ourselves when we are being tossed around in the murky waters of life. Jesus is always beside us to help us. Let us not forget to beckon on him. We cannot go it alone. That is the mistake a lot of us make, that we can go it alone. When we read, Without God, nothing is possible. This is the practical demonstration of it. We cannot go it alone. Jesus is beside us. Allow him to rest inside our heart. It is rather us that we wake up to that realization that one with God is majority. The Lord be with you. Days of cold comes bringing all the restless We send the light, send the light There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save Send the light, send the light, send the light The blessed gospel light, let it shine From shore to shore